welcome again, everyone. Uh, my name is Juan Carlos Lopez. I'm coming to you from uh, Mi'kmaq, the unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. I am at Akira University. I say this as um, my compromise to, like a very good colleague of mine always says, you know, listen and listen and then listen. And when you are done listening, go and listen some more uh, because I want to learn the truth. I want to learn uh, about what have happened uh, uh, because I hope that in my learning uh, uh, or that learning will inform uh, the way in which we work towards the colonization and, and reconciliation. I also uh, would like to acknowledge that uh, in this, this area where I'm at in, in Nova Scotia have had several waves of, of people of African descent to have come into these lands and the, the the recorded record goes back to about 400 years. So uh, I, and I do this also to uh, acknowledge that I want to uh, listen and learn. And I think this is important because as, a, as an immigrant and as a settler in these lands, uh, I think it, it is my duty to, to listen, to learn, and, and to move us uh, forward into a better future for, for everyone. So uh, that, that's, uh, that's uh, my, my my start, my acknowledgement. And today uh, we are uh, at our first uh, Better Together of the winter uh, season. We are very fortunate to have um, Dr. Elizabeth, well, Elizabeth Wells from, from Mount Allison University. And I, I will let uh, uh, Elizabeth introduce herself, but thank you for joining us and, and just, you know, take it away, Elizabeth. Thank you very much, Juan Carlos. It's great to be here. I'm Elizabeth Wells. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about me in a moment. It's actually part of my presentation to uh, connect with you a little bit about who I am. I just want to say that my phone rings and I have to stop it. That um, we have so many people today that we're going to have the chat open. And then we had, um, we, so if you have something to say or a question, there are a couple of points at which I'm going to stop and ask a question. Juan Carlos will read out some answers and that's how we're going to handle handle that. Everyone will be mute during the uh, during the, the presentation. So this presentation is called Getting to Know You, but I also call it Only Connect, the old E.M. Forster quote about humanizing the 21st century classroom. Um, objectives of our session are pretty clear for, uh, for the 45 minutes or so that we'll have before questions. To discuss recent findings on engagement and retention, to explore ways in which our university communities are becoming depersonalized, and I think we all feel this to a certain extent, especially after COVID, to consider how important personal contact is to student learning and the perception of learning, and present models and examples of humanizing the classroom through assignments, activities, course materials, and extracurricular practices. So I'm going to talk a lot about things that I do. I have some colleagues who also do some wonderful things along these lines, and I'll probably throw some of theirs in as we go. Um, but just a sense that that's what we're going to try to do now, is uh, to look at the idea of personalizing the classroom a little bit. Now, here's a picture of me wearing the same top I'm wearing right now, just so you recognize me. Uh, just so you know, I'm an undergraduate at the University of Toronto in Canada. Um, I got my PhD in musicology, uh, which is the... Um, critique, uh, analysis, and history of music at the Eastman School of Music in Rochester, New York. I'm a specialist in musical theater. I wrote a book about West Side Story, and actually just this morning I got uh, a, a, a request to speak about Cheetah Rivera, who originated the uh, character of Anita in West Side Story, because she just uh, unfortunately died, and they wanted a, a quote. So I, I still do things with musical theater. Um, I've been here at Mount Allison in, in Sackville, New Brunswick, which is uh, on the east coast of Canada, for those who don't know, since 2001. So I've been here about 22 years. I was formerly head of department, where a lot of these ideas came to me, actually, and uh, Department of Music, and I was Dean of Arts for a little while as well. So I've had a lot of different things going on in my career um, as a scholar and a teacher. And since about 2002, I started doing um, more scholarship of teaching and learning. So I talk about professionalism marks, which is my version of participation marks. Um, assessment, retention, curricular reform and design is something that I talk about a lot. And um, faculty attitudes toward marking, toward grading is something that I actually talk about, which many people find interesting. So that's a whole grad bag of, of things that I do, but that's where, where I come from. So just to get to know me just a bit. Um, 
Let's talk a little bit about retention of students. This is so important to us nowadays to either to attract or retain students. And students are more likely to persist when they find themselves in settings that hold high expectations for their learning, provide needed academic and social support, and actively involve them with other students and faculty and learning. That's Tinto 2002. These are some of the strategies that have happened over the years to try to improve our relationship with students. Something like starfish retention solutions, the idea of office hour management, early alert systems, which we have here at Mount Allison for students who are struggling, um, streamlining advising and getting people with the right advisors. Um, certainly recruitment is also a personal touch thing here at Mount Allison. I know that, that letters go out of offer with personal uh, comments on them from the recruiters or from somebody in the administration. Of course, academic advising is a great way to get to know students and know what they're doing and what, what they're looking at for their studies. Um, and first year experience and foundation courses. I run a foundation course in music history here at Mount Allison, which is meant to get to know the students and for the students to get to know me a little bit before they dive into the entire four year degree. So it covers you know, music, obviously music history, because that's what I teach but also you know, writing and critical skills. And I get them to think about their own histories of music, which is uh, an interesting um, uh, process to go through. Of course, I put small class sizes. You'll all be saying, well, my classes are getting bigger and bigger, but the idea of having smaller class sizes obviously is a strategy to connect more personally and directly with students. But it seems that personal contact with faculty seems to be the most important factor in engaging and retaining students across the board. So here's our depersonalized atmosphere. I just mentioned one of these things, larger class sizes, right? There are more people than we can get to know. Uh, more time and energy our demand, demands are put on faculty and students. I'm writing a book right now called Overteaching, which is about uh, the, all the things that we're doing and all the things that our students working and having kids and being married and, and doing all these other things on the side that we never had to do when, when, when I went to school. Um, so it's harder to spend more time together. Um, the explosion in the number of disciplines, conferences, information, uh, that's going to be depersonalizing. Of course, again, I say more part-time, full-time employed students, mature students with families, students with disabilities, all of these people have challenges that make it harder sometimes for them to connect with their, uh, with their studies and with the university. Of course, especially since COVID and we're doing it right now, more technology is mediating students, faculty and administration. I think all of my meetings this year uh, for committees have been on Zoom, even though we're all in the same small town. So that mediated technology, again, people get zoomed out, of course, uh, by by being on these technologies, but it's part of our modern world. Um, you all received an email that says, hey, you know, how about the syllabus or something? Um, and it seems like students are maybe being a little bit too jocular or a little bit too familiar. And then sometimes we send an email to someone that we think is clear and it comes across a different way. So um, email is, a, is an uh, ubiquitous thing, but it's not always a good way to connect with people. And of course, the Internet in general, creating the appearance of being connected without any kind of personal contact. And so all of these things have depersonalized, and especially since COVID, I would say, uh, and I think you'd agree with me there, our, um, our atmosphere, the places where we work. But we're also in an increasingly dangerous landscape. Um, I heard recently of a student breaking into a faculty member's house and stalking them. Um, attacks on faculty doing research in some fields. Um, the Virginia Tech massacre and other acts of violence taking place in educational set settings. And of course, freedom of information protection issues. We cannot know certain things about our students, even things that would be helpful for us to know unless they reveal them to us. And of course, harassment, invasions of privacy are more prevalent and more litigious than we've ever seen them before. So we're in a dangerous landscape where we don't know what to do, but we know we want to do something that will help. So if we cannot know them, my question is, can they know us? And what is the value of them knowing us? And what do they want and need to know about us that would be uh, good for them and good for us? So I just want you to think, this is a little exercise, and you can put your, your answer answers in the chat, and Juan Carlos will pick a couple to read out. But think of the most important teacher you ever had, and what do you remember most about that person? And I'll just give you a few minutes to uh, to think about that. Most people can come up with it right away, and they know what it was. But I'll let Juan Carlos give you some uh, some snippets of people's uh, responses. Yeah. 
if we have any. I'm sure we'll have some. Here we go. All right. So I'll just read. Uh, seemed like they cared. He encouraged my interest and made me feel like I was perfectly capable of pursuing that interest, kindness, rigor, and intelligence. She knew me and was invested in my success. They showed they cared about me as a person. My mm -hmm. English teacher was interested in my success. I felt they were on my side. He cared who I was, how engaging and accessible they were, and silly, <laughs> just a joyful presence. Care, how invested they were in meaning student connections. He listened. A grade seven teacher identified story I wrote as excellent. First time ever. The teacher that recognized and honored my unique abilities and encouraged me to pursue studies in a unique way. Really simplified concepts and made it okay to know answers. Never made me feel dumb. Made it okay to, I imagine, not to know answers. They showed that they were also human with flaws. What honest and, and forward, was honest and forward, even if it wasn't something I wanted to hear. Energy, she was fun, she had a career and a family was unusually my childhood experience. My mother, she's still alive, but her support, love, and belief in me gave me important frameworks uh, through which to think about and understand the world, change the way I see uh, things around me. Overall, faculty in my department as an undergraduate uh, treated me with respect. So you see most of those, a couple of them are about thinking, you know, and, and ideation, but many more of those were about, they cared about me. They knew who I was. They knew what I wanted and needed in teaching and what I wanted to do with my life. So this personal connection to those teachers is the thing that you remember most about that person. So that's why, again, for us as teachers, we've got to think that us as individual humans having a flawed, you know, human experience is actually very engaging for students. So what the research suggests, and I'm going to talk about a couple of studies here, that student evaluation of teaching correlation between how professors' personality is viewed and the quality of teaching and learning that is perceived by the students. I'm going to talk about Clayson on instructor traits, Miranda Clark on a study of marketing students, and Clayson Shevet on personality and student evaluations of teaching. Okay, so we'll have a few snippets from some of these uh, some of these scholars. Do we improve or change over time? Important traits of teachers that, that students wanted were they were optimistic, confident, dominant, active, enthusiastic, and likable. Attributes such as knowledge, fairness, and organization were perceived as improving through time with experience. So the students' perceptions of instructor characteristics described as responsive, interesting, cares, stimulating, and open remained constant. Okay. So what's the ideal teaching environment? We could assume that an environment that the students perceive as accepting, warm, and energetic would be conducive to learning. In fact, interviews of marketing students indicate that their first priority when looking at instruction is that instructors are empathetic, caring, and understanding, thus sustaining the human interface. So exactly what I'm talking about today. Rapport, that, that ineffable thing that happens between people. Rapport, the ability to maintain harmonious relations based on affinity for others, comprised a greater variety of comments than all other themes. This theme of mutual understanding, sympathy, and concordance or trust between people presented more than 20 categories of comments that were eventually collapsed into this one general concept. And this was rapport was rated higher than delivery, fairness, knowledge, and credibility. And our old thing we always fall back on organization and preparation. Relationships then, Brenda and Clark, participants were nearly universal in their desire to build relationships, especially ones of mutual trust and harmony with their instructors. They develop great respect for the professor who listens well, but also enjoy occasions when the instructor opens up and tells students about him or herself sharing personal and professional life experiences. And here's a student comment. When you get to the point where professors don't mind talking about themselves and their experiences, it makes you feel better about learning from them and it makes you want to open up to them too. I feel so much better when I can hold a conversation with someone I know something about. I won't be as wary about going to their office for help or being in a situation where I'm one-on-one -on -one and worrying about how the conversation's going to go. It's just nice to know that they are going to share things with you. If you're going to be sharing 
so this is an interesting part of the research which I, which I find really fascinating. In this experiment, students were exposed to a number of different professors on the first day who introduced themselves at the beginning of the course for five minutes, then left. The students recorded their impressions of each one of these people. And then each one of those professors taught a section of the course, which involved lecturing, grading, et cetera, over time. And then students were polled again at the end of the course after they had had this collection of people who had introduced themselves and that they had rated. Here's a questions asked of the student pertaining to how they would evaluate their instructor's effectiveness, including questions about their perception of the learning environment, grading standards, and satisfaction with learning could be replaced with a personality inventory of the instructor with little change in outcome. In other words, they gave the exact, exactly the same uh, review of the person that they did. And I'm just going to remind you that this evaluation was secured in the first five minutes of the class. So when you're thinking about how you present yourselves to students and how you're setting the tone of the course, you've got about five minutes and then you're set. <laughs> the cake has set. And that's what you're gonna be seen as for the rest of that course, no matter what you do, okay? So that's an interesting thing for us to think about when we're, talk when we're thinking about student evaluations of teaching that nobody ever told you that this was the way people work, that humans work, or at least the way students work. And you probably heard that the idea of entertaining students and the Dr. Fox effect, which was first determined in the 1970s. And for those of you who know, I won't go into much detail, but they had a professional actor give a charismatic and enthusiastic class with very little content. Okay. Students gave a high rating to a person who was very entertaining, but didn't have very much content, con context or uh, content. Now, this has since been refuted. In fact, students rate highly level of content and evaluation are less influenced by charisma or sense of humor. So this has kind of been shown to be a little bit uh, old fashioned, this idea. But there's still people still talk about the Dr. Fox effect and this actor who knew nothing about what he was talking about being very charismatic. So I want you to take, do another little exercise here for Juan Carlos in the chat. What do you remember about me from my slide? five minutes of this class. Now that could be my personality, that could be where I went to school, that could be anything about me that you recall from the first five minutes that I spoke. And I'll give you a minute to do this because I think this is an interesting exercise to take faculty through as well. I'm going to wait to see a few, right? So that we don't... Yeah. Uh, there. They're rolling in. It's actually good that the rest of the people don't see it so that they, they can give the impression. Yes. All right, so let's start reading. Just read some good ones, yeah. Musical theater person just interviewed West Side Story actress. You went to school in Rochester, New York. Music background interest. Music book. Current school, Dean, expertise in musical in, in musical theater, which I found fascinating. Went to university went to University of Toronto. You wrote the same, <laughs> you wore the same shirt as the photo. <laughs> Musicology and musical theater. Loves musical theater and knowledgeable about West Side Story. I remember that you introduced yourself with your CV. Uh, what you have done matters to you involved with musical theater. You graduated for U of T. I'm glad someone cares about the relationship they have with students. Musical theater background, yeah, connection. You are wearing the same shirt. You <laughs> Right, who would think that that would be a thing you'd remember? But let's just, let's just stop there, let's just stop there. And it was really funny exercise. because that's, that's the first thing I told you, Elizabeth, when you came in the call, because I really liked the, the pattern with of the shirt. Uh, Do you remember anything about the objectives of this session? Your voice, your energy, a PhD, went to Eastman, book to an over... Uh, Probably you over don't teaching. remember what you came here for, which is to see a presentation on the objectives of the session. But you remember all these things about me that I just told you just to sort of... Again, I did that so that we would have something to talk about. But um, it's kind of interesting, isn't it, that the things about me personally and what I did and what I experienced were the things you remember from that first five minutes. Interesting. So what I'm going to do right now is going to go through a number of practices that I have developed over the years to help create this, this feeling of connection 
without giving too much away. Okay, so I'll just let you read that that slide, and then I'll go through uh, in in a little bit de of detail uh, and tell you how I developed it and why I developed it to create this kind of connection with students, including you'll see Facebook, which is probably a surprising one to you. Okay, so this is my old web CT, but there's a little picture of me in a, in a different shirt. And this is a section that I have on every course, which is called, uh, if there it's head information, I was head, faculty information. And so I have a lot of different things in there. I have like videos, I have statements, I have interviews, I have all kinds of things that students can get to know me a little bit instead of me telling them uh, if they're interested in knowing more about me as their instructor. So, Everyone can do this and you can just put in there whatever you want and invite students to look through it whenever they're whenever they're interested in, in learning about you. I was involved in a, a, a project at, at Mount A called five questions with Dr. You know, so and so. And so we had five questions with Dr. Rose, a very short thing. They asked me a few questions and it was just there. It was a, a quick read. Um, my teaching philosophy is very important to me uh, because I try to live it all the time and it's freely available on the web. So what I invite people to do in the first day of classes is to read my teaching philosophy. It lists reasons and attitudes behind my teaching style, not just the methods that I employ, but why I do it. I'm a humanist, and so I'm always talking about humanism and connection. And in my intro class, I ask them to write their own learning philosophy with leading questions that are very similar to mine, but also ask them to read mine as a way to, to know how a philosophy is different from a, a, a statement or a research statement. So this sets the scene for here I am, here you are, this is why I do what I do. You know, if you're wondering why I do the things I do, here's why. And for my statement is very personal, as I said. Something that was done at Mount A a number of years ago. It was posted on iTunes University. I don't know if iTunes University is still in operation, but this was part of a campus radio prof session series. And someone came to my office and interviewed me for 30 views on teaching. So again, I invite students to listen to this if they want to. Uh, it also exists as a transcript for anyone who is interested in just skimming it or looking at it or reading it as opposed to listening. And this, again, was a very in-depth interview about why I teach the way I do and what I think about teaching. And so again, it gets people to know a little bit more about me um, and my my. Um, I have a CV that I also have under um, under your the resources on your professor. I have this updated academic CV with my educational history, the courses I've taught, different grants and awards and publications and papers. And so what this does is let them know that I'm a whole person who does all these different things. Um, I think sometimes people think, students think that you're just a teacher and that maybe you do research in the summer, but this gives a sense of what my interests are, but also what kinds of things professors do. And I often find it's very interesting to students to find out, you know, what a typical day is like for us. You know, we sometimes we're at a committee meeting, sometimes we're in the classroom, sometimes we're writing a paper, sometimes we're reviewing something. Um, so I always put that in there as a way of sort of showing this is who I am, this is what I do, and this is what professors do. Um, a couple of years ago, a number of years ago now, I was running the same foundation course that I've been referring to. And every assignment, there were about 10 assignments throughout the term, but they were all different, all completely different things. And somebody said in class, can you go over the assignment? And someone else said, it's already in the syllabus. She gave you a step-by-step -step of what to do. I know, but can you tell me? So I thought, okay, well, let's make this more human. We, we don't want to spend a lot of class time going over something which they can read in the syllabus. So I went out with my colleague, Tony Roberts, who I think is on the call today. And um, we at those in those days, we had a video camera. We didn't have smartphones. But I just made a whole number of short, informative, casual videos about, you know, I'd say, okay, for the side of this week, I'd like you to think about this. And then, you know, when you thought about that, then do this, then do this. And it wasn't any different than what was in the syllabus. But for people who need someone to tell them, it was more uh, uh, helpful. Um, I would provide sort of further context and elaboration on the assignments. I also had one at the very beginning of the course that just introduced them to university and what the university experience was about. And I thought, no one's going to watch these. Like, this is going to be that. People were watching them over and over again. And what I realized is that 
because it's me talking in a very casual and informal way, there's a connection that I'm making hum humanly with these people through video that is not made by having a list of things in the syllabus. So the instructional videos have become a really big thing. I made one on professionalism, my professionals of marks. I made one on taking exams. I made one on plagiarism with actors. And um, they really took off as a way to have a more of an interface with the students. I also had somebody follow me around for 20 minutes. It ended up being 20 minutes. It was it was uh, 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 during the day. They followed me from the front door of my house to the office, which is the head's office, the classroom, my study, driving in the car. I was talking about, you know, there's many academics who are married to other academics who live across the country and they have to figure out their travel schedules and how to raise children. And I just talked, these were not my issues, but I just talked about the complexity of the job and how professors need to do certain things and how they, they do other things that you might not understand. And so it's just called a day in the life of a musicologist. And anyone can do this. It's fun. It was great. Um, we were in all different places and sort of talked to people as we were going through the, the classroom and the, the hallway. Um, my reference policy doesn't seem like it should be something that is humanizing, but I have a policy that students have to let me know in a certain amount of time. Uh, they have to give me their CV. They have to write a statement of some kind. They have to show me what program they're, um, they're applying to. And it makes them think more about their applications and get things done in a timely manner. But in my, in my teaching philosophy, I talk about trust, accountability, organization, and truthfulness. And so what I ask them to do is to model what I've already tried to get to model as a teacher for them in the process of asking me to to write them application grants or or references for different jobs. So that's that's a sort of a smaller one, but it does kind of again make the connection between who I am and what I'm about and what I would like them to be about. Um, for professionalism, performance projects, oral presentations, and essays, I have rubrics and grade scales. Many people have these now. I have a document how to study for exams. I do color-coded grading of my papers. And again, this kind of transparency and accountability and assessment is part of what makes it easier for them to ask a question, to challenge a grade, to prepare in ways that I've shown them that I used to prepare when I was their age and I was in school. This is an interesting thing. I don't know if you've ever read this book, The Chicago Guide to Your Academic Career. But it takes you from grad school through tenure to post tenure blues and everything in between. And so what I talk about, it, I have some of this assigned in my research methods course for people who want to go to grad school, because the section on grad school is pretty harrowing in terms of what it's really like. And so I talk a little bit about my academic life. I talk about what it was like in grad school. I talk about going to, I talk about things I just read in a, in a journal this weekend that have nothing to do with anything, but, you know, was related somehow to course content. I talk about my conferences and what conference paper I gave and what it was like and how people responded. Um, I talk to them about what I'm interested in doing in terms of service. Um, I refer to performances, classes, readings, from, as I say, from grad school and undergrad, and career issues in my discipline uh, that come up with musicologists as a way of, again, as having a regular sort of, um, I guess, guide to what I'm going through as an academic um, in, my, in, my, in the field of musicology. This is a, the, the photo I have on Facebook. It's different from this photo that I have on with my shirt today. I am on Facebook, but I rarely post to it. In other words, I don't put anything that I wouldn't say out in the street uh, to anybody on Facebook. I usually put announcements of books coming out or a conference I went to, or sometimes, you know, I'm having a root canal or something that's just very benign. I, I allow, I don't, I don't add students, but students can add me as a friend. I accept all of their friend requests and I've got people on there for years. I don't even know them anymore. I have my headshot, but no personal information, no status, no relationship status. And so it's a repository for a community, which I am a casual observer. So these people can feel that they're connected to me in some real way, but there's no danger to me. And there's really no danger to them because they know I'm on there too, in terms of things that they might post. Now, I'll just read you a little thing, which I think we all agree is that students may feel undue pressure and intimidation given the power that the faculty has over students. And like the majority of their relationships with friends, the pre-existing real-life faculty-student relationship is not a peer relationship. Students may feel intimidated or obligated to engage in an online social network relationship with a faculty member simply because they recognize the authority and power resident in the faculty. Students may feel powerless to refuse the online invitation, and despite privacy controls, college users can feel that their community boundary has been breached. My advice, this is uh, from Online Social Networking on Campus, 
don't friend students and don't accept their invitation to be in their network. A code of Facebook ethics for faculty currently exists on the site, and I would recommend the faculty review it. So that's a different feeling about it. Uh, my feeling is, again, I've never friended a, or, or tried to friend request a student, but I've had many students who just like my class and wanted to, to see what I've, I've got on, on, on Facebook. And that's, I guess, I would have more privacy if I didn't do that, but I, I'm a totally private person, so it doesn't matter. This is probably one of the most powerful things that I ever did uh, is I have a cat who has passed on now, Shasha, who is a beautiful, beautiful cat. And, you know, before class starts, when you're kind of warming up and people are coming in, I would say, oh, Shasha did this or Shasha would do that. And sometimes she shows up in my instructional videos in the background. Um, I have two pictures of her on my desk um, on the on the Christmas tree, the faculty Christmas tree at Christmas time. They used to put up an ornament with with Shasha on it. So. When people would come to my office to talk, they would see the cat and they would start to talk about their own pets or they would ask me about the pet. Um, she never came to school, but when I was head, I did bring her one day because people begged me to bring her. I took her to the head's office, set her up in there all closed. And I said, if you would like to visit her, you can knock softly on the door and come and pet her. So a couple of people petted her. People were crazy about Shasha, but they liked um, like the idea that I had a, a pet. And I mean, how personal is that? I mean, she was, she's a beautiful cat. She was a beautiful cat. But it gave you this, this one pertinent personal detail that made people feel they knew something about you, all that we were talking about in the first couple of slides, uh, without ever having to worry about, you know, whether they're going to steal her or something. I don't know. I'll tell you that everything I've just described today works in any class size. So if you have a large class, you can do it. If you have a small class, you can do it. If you have a seminar, you can do it. All of these things are perfectly accessible. They don't require any work on your part, except maybe to post some things on your Moodle page or your course management system about yourself. And this is what my students don't know about me. My marital status, my sexual orientation, how much money I make, except you can go online. On, I have a faculty association, so it's actually publicly available. Where I live and who I live with my home phone number, cell number, or home email, my religious affiliation, if any, although I was I was ordained as a deacon a couple of years ago, so I have mentioned that a couple of times, my social network, my political or social beliefs or affiliations, even though I live in a town of 5,000 people and I run into these people every day, okay? This is what I rarely ever experienced, despite everything I've said today. People crying in my office, shocking or inappropriate revelations, except occasionally when I was head, I would have to deal with some things. People contesting a grade or citing unfairness. I have no disciplinary issues inside or outside of the classroom. I've never had anyone, in my opinion, cross a boundary and you know ask me something I didn't want to tell or whatever. Um, a loss of trust. I have very few people cheat in my classes and people wasting my time because they know that I'm busy. And I don't make it that I'm so busy that they don't wanna bother me. But now that they know what I do all day, they'll say, they'll often say, hey, I know you're probably writing a paper, but can you answer this question? Or, oh, I know you have a lot of things on the go, but can you meet with me? Um, I have a policy, uh, 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 the office hours policy that is on demand. I have Calendly, which many of you might have. There's also a Microsoft product called Meetings, I think Microsoft Meetings. So I let anybody, between nine and five, Monday to Friday, book me at any time they want and i say if you book me and i'm not busy doing something else i will meet with you i usually do on zoom because you know i can can't run back and forth all the time but again that accessibility but i rarely experience any problems so i guess now that we're getting a little bit later in the session and i would like to open it up to questions and discussion what do you know about me now and has that changed since the first five minutes of this presentation or has it do you still remember that i'm wearing the same shirt do I seem like the same person I was? I've told you a lot of personal details about my cat and what I do. Um, has, it, have, have it, has it really changed? What do you know about me now? And I'll just let people um, wander in if they have anything to, uh, to say about that. And again, I know the Facebook one is a very contentious one, which is why I gave my, my opinion and also the, the kind of official opinion. But I think too, the, the thing is that Facebook is for old people now. So not many students actually use it. So I don't, uh, I don't find that many people friend me anymore. Juan Carlos will read any good ones. So we, we do have a comment from Donna Sears, but we will reserve that to the end. Uh, that's a very good question she's got. Um, but I'll start reading. 
you're a deacon. <laughs> you create boundaries, no extra. Uh, I think, oh my goodness, they're moving. I think you like students and teaching, lots of idea on how to humanize courses and reason on why you should. You make parts of yourself, including your teaching philosophy, which I see as being a part of you, very accessible to students. Basic teaching philosophy interests use visual technologies, focus on humanis humanism, strategies for engagement. Okay, that's good. It, what's, what's her question? Is it time for that question? Well, the question is actually a very good one. What is uh, it? So now that the semester is well underway, we have missed the opportunity for a first new impression. Any research or advice on how to apply what we are learning today at this point in the semester? Yeah, I know. We, we're, we're the first better together, but we're a little past the first five minutes. Um, I would say that there's always a time, and it should be an iterative thing. I mean, yeah, we talk about the first five minutes, but I think it should be an iterative thing that you talk about your work. I remember when I was in grad school, we would have these seminars, and I never heard about my professor's research, and that would have been the most helpful thing for me to know, how they did it, where they, where they, what archives they went to, how they organized their time. So there's always a chance to come in and say, hey, you know, I wanted to tell you something really interesting that happened to me the other day. I went to this conference, and in fact, I said this, and Alan Dodson, admit him, because he's the person I was talking to. We were talking in the hallway about a, an up-and-coming uh, scholar of Islamic chant. And just the other day, I had somebody in giving a talk about, this is a medieval music, medieval chant, and how we don't really know what the rest of the world was doing outside of the Western canon. And Dr. Dodson said, there's this guy who's now doing this. He's able to read the language. He's able to understand the notation. And in fact, the Islamic world had notation that they were developing at the same time. And we had just finished talking about this in class. So I went and I said, listen, kids, we're going to try to invite this guy. I don't know what his name is, but he's just done this. So my excitement about my personal interest in chant is suddenly part of their world. And they got excited. So, I mean, that's kind of me. That's what I'm interested in. And I think you can always take an opportunity to just take a few minutes at the beginning of a class, at the end of the class, on a break, just to talk a little bit about what, what you're working on or what you're interested in. Um, if you want to, I don't have any hobbies, but if I did, I might talk about them. Um, you know, usually those things are pretty benign. Um, so that's what I would suggest is that it's an iterative process. It's a building trust process that happens over a long period of time of which the first five minutes is probably the most impactful, I hate that word, um, and which uh, continues on through the um, through the, the course of the semester. That's my, that's, my, that's my answer. That's what I found. I will just say, um, what would you like your students to know about you? How could you personal, how could your personal experiences enhance your teaching practice? And I also remind you that you have to make the first move. You are the authority figure. So if you sh show that it's okay to talk about your interests or to talk about the weather or whatever it is you want to talk about that seems a little bit more personal or, or less, you know, professional, you have to be open that door and be an open person. Um, and as I say, I've never experienced anybody taking advantage of me as a result of any of these practices or of my personality the way it is. So I think that it is safer and probably even more fun than we ever thought before. Now, if you want to, we, we will have a discussion now, but if you want to talk to me about this, I would love to talk to people. I've got a, 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 a website called The Organized Academic, and my email is there is theorganizedacademic at gmail, or you can write to me at emails at mta.ca. And I just wanted to tell you that I go everywhere doing stuff on productivity, time management, work-life balance is very important to me. If you're interested, I write for University Affairs, a column called The Academic Achiever, which comes out every month with, with advice on things like this. And I think I'm gonna do a column on this. Um, and uh, I would love to hear from you. Uh, my book, The Organized Academic, which I always like to, to push, just came out last year in Roman and Littlefield. It's not about any of this, but if you're interested in my ideas or you like what you heard today, that's uh, just a couple of things about me. So I'll just go back to my email address uh, and we'll take any questions or discussion that you want to have at, at this point about about the, the subject. In the chat. And when Carlos will be taking questions, comments. So there was a, there was a comment. Your cat as personal in personal connection point. Reminded me, this is from the question you asked before, reminded me of when I worked with a prof who wore terrible ties, always. He said, uh, oh, it moved, hold on. Uh, 
he said students were going to complain about something. So you might as well hand them something. It was <laughs> personal and impersonal. And it was indeed what students complained about on evaluations. They were inappropriate, few. <laughs> mm -hmm. Other thoughts? So either things you've done or things you were th are thinking of doing, or if you don't want to do any of these things. I think they're all very valuable. And I have to say, you know, I, I have befriended students over the years who have become my TAs, my research assistants, and they've become lifelong friends. And I wouldn't know them uh, and have that those valuable lifelong relationships if I had not met them as a person when I was teaching them. It just wouldn't have happened. Feel free to post any comments on the chat. Uh, thank you so much. This is affirming. <laughs> Another question. So do you try to learn students' name? I have around 400 students a semester and I worry about learning a few names, but not all of that names because I don't want to seem like I'm choosing favorites. Yes. Okay. I have small classes. I You are unfortunately have a large class. There are always people who talk a lot and you end up sort of connecting with them a bit more because they will talk and you talk back and forth with them. I usually use, learn those people's names first just because it comes up. But in my classes, I try to memorize all the names within one week. And what I do to help me with this is I have a video that they post for 30 seconds to Moodle that's called Here I Am. So they just come and say, hi, I'm Juan Carlos. I'm, I'm part of the Maple League and I really like cats and I'm happy to be in this class. You suddenly have a face. You have a face and you have a name. And you can go over that as many times as you need to to get the names. Now, with 400 people, I don't know how you do it. But learning some of the names at least shows that you care. I think they know that you can't learn all 400 names. But I wouldn't worry about seeming to be favoriting people just because they've introduced themselves to you or you've learned their names. So that's that's my that's my suggestion. It's it's, it's a wonderful uh, tool. And I think it was my colleague, Alan Dawson, who actually took pictures of the students on the first day to learn their names and so he could go over it. Um, and again, I'm talking about classes with 30, maybe 40 people in them. So it's not it's not as onerous, but that's what um, that's what I do. And I think that's what he does, too. I, I have personally worked with big sections, too. And, and what I tell the students and even the TAs that work with me, is like I, I go right up and I say, I am really bad with names. So I may ask you your name, and, and this is my, my joke uh, part is, you know, I may ask you your names, your, your name 10 times. I remember your face. I won't remember your name. So after 10 times, then get on my case, of course. That's a great, that's a great way to go about it. And you're humanizing yourself, right? You're flawed. You can't remember many people's names. So, yeah. So uh, there is a comment here. I've done assignment videos and videos about academic integrity and currently redeveloping curriculum and this just highlights for me to ensure that I continue to do this again. Good. Great learning. Thank you so much. What do you ask your students to call could to call you in class? So for example, Dr. Wells, first name, etc. I invite my students on the first day. I say I'm Dr. Wells. Um, I said you can call me Dr. Wells or you can call me Doc. For some reason, I like the idea of being like a pharmacist from a small town. And so I had a whole cohort of students that called me Doc, and they still do when they write to me for for you know to get a reference or something. Um, I don't use my first name because again, I, I I worked hard for that doctorate, and it makes it easier for them not to feel too personal with me. Like you know, I I wish that we could call students Mister and Miss and Ms. and they or whatever whatever I guess that's not they are pronouns, but. I wish that we could give them the same respect of their boundary of who they are that that we expect them to give us. But I always say Dr. Wells, and they've always called me Dr. Wells. Occasionally, I get to know somebody who has referred to me, like in the hallway, we we, we know each other, and, and they'll say Elizabeth. And I said, you know, when we're alone, that's fine, but never do that in front of a student because it looks like you have a special privilege. So just call me Dr. Wells, even though I know you and you know that I'm Elizabeth. And they've always respected that. Uh, another comment is, thank you for this. I'm a student engagement librarian, and we know from research that students are intimidated to speak with librarians. I have been searching for ways to help personalize the librarians with the students. While we might not have your our own classroom, we can still do videos. Thanks. Okay, good. 
the video thing was a complete, as I say, a complete shock and a complete game changer for me. Uh, another and question. I never had anybody ask in class to go over the assignment after that. That's it funny. never happened. That's ever funny. again. So really? that's a, a lot of saving of classroom time. So another comment. Such a great idea. Just get them to put their names on a piece of paper for the first few classes. I'm switching to your method for sure. Thanks. <laughs> okay. I like the video idea. I wonder if that is a problem for their privacy, but I guess if they choose to post them, then it should be fine. Can you explain? Yeah, they, you I mean, it's them? not a requirement. We don't grade it. We just invite them to do it. And they and most of them just love doing it because they want to be on TV like everybody else in the world. So, But the video is only, you are the only person who can watch the video or is it open? I'm the only person who watches the video. It's all within Moodle, so it's not on YouTube or anything like that. Okay. Uh, okay, so I do that. Uh, in an online class I teach, and instead of taking 40 minutes to have the students say, hi, my name is, and I'm, you know, so-and-so, at great length, they have an assignment to do an introduction with parameters and post it for everybody. This way, they all get a chance to know each other and can do so in a thoughtful way. Yeah, revealing whatever they want to reveal. Somebody said, this is, I like the 10 times thing. I will do that. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one, Carlos. What was the name of the journal you edit? I didn't catch it initially. I don't edit a journal. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't think. I'm in journals. I mean, yeah. <laughs> but maybe where you wrote. Uh... Oh, University Affairs. Yeah. Yeah, maybe. University Affairs is the Canadian equivalent of the Chronicle of Higher Education in the United States. It's a national magazine for professors. And so I have a column in there which comes out every well, every couple of months or so on um, advice. And I think I'm going to make these, this one of my advices. And, you know, I, 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 I think it's funny that sometimes people speak very poorly of students and they'll say the most terrible things about students. And I thought, you know, if the this was an ethnic minority or something, and you said that same sentence and took the word students out and put in that minority, we'd all be pillaring you. I mean, but it seems to be okay to dehumanize students and make them into people we don't like or people who do bad things. And I think, I think we need to have more respect for students because they're people. So we got a question here. Could you please provide a reference list for your presentation? There are a couple of articles that you mentioned that I would like to explore in more depth. We can certainly- I will do, I will do. In fact, if you write to me, write to me and I, I think I have a slide at the very end that says, if you want a copy of these slides, write to me and I will look up those, those for you and, and provide them. Yeah. All right. How are we doing for time? We have about 10 minutes and some people have already written, uh, thank you running for another meeting. Thank you running for another meeting. Thank you. So those I'm not <laughs> reading, but thank you. Thank you. I'm going. So, you know, if you have more questions, great. If not, you know, we, we can let people go to the ne their next uh, uh, thing, you know, because we're jumping from. Yeah. And I just said, just write to me and I'd be happy to talk to you because I love talking to people. I highly recommend Dr. Wells' book, The Organized Academic. Oh, thank you. That's very kind. It's a totally different topic. I don't, I don't touch on any of this in that book, but um, yes. thank you very much. Okay, Juan Carlos, well, uh, thank you. And thank okay. you all for thank coming. Thank you, Elizabeth. This this was wonderful. Thank you very much for, for opening the, the session. And we're getting the messages of thank you so much uh, and so on and so forth. Thank you. Hi, uh, Greg. Hi. So, yeah, so uh, there, there is something that we informally do. We usually get the, the cameras on and then we wave at the, at the presenter to to thank them as we, as we leave. So you know, Oh, that's fine. Like Are you going to do just, that? Yes, yeah. we can do that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, thank you everyone.